Hi, I'm Steve Clemens, and I have some questions. Why is it so easy to own an exotic pet like a lion or a tiger in America? What's the hidden industry behind this trend? And what does the conservation movement stand for? Let's get to the bottom line. Barely a day goes by in the United States without a headline about someone getting hurt when their exotic animal turns on them or lets loose in a neighborhood. But that's not slowing down the craze to own one. Tune into TikTok and the feeds abound with videos of baby tigers, leopards, wolves, foxes, huge anacondas and pythons and more. For generations, we've seen cute baby tigers appear on America's leading talk shows, often called ambassador animals, who are linked to those that are in zoos, all allegedly validated by a conservation industry. Well, think again. Today we're talking about a new film that aims to expose the abuse and trafficking that's behind the scenes of this trend. The documentary is called The Conservation Game, and it's directed by Michael Weber, who's been tracking this issue for years and years. Carney Ann Nasser is one of America's leading big cat experts and animal protection attorneys. She became the second full-time animal law professor in the world when Michigan State University appointed her to direct the Animal Welfare Clinic of the College of Law. And Carol Baskin is the CEO of Big Cat Rescue in Tampa, Florida, where she started 30 years ago and has brought so much attention to the plight of captive and abused big cats. It's a real pleasure to have you on here. And I should say at the outset to my audience, I've seen the film. It is powerful. It has made an impact on me. And so congratulations. But our, our audience has not yet seen the film, Michael Webb. So can you share with us, can you give our, our audience a picture of what you've done, what you've exposed, and why? Sure. I think it probably starts with my work undercover at the exotic animal auctions. You know, so it's at these auctions where you will see uh, tiger cubs, lion cubs. These are exotic uh, animal auctions in America. That's, that's correct. In America, exotic animal auctions where they will sell animals out to the general public, no licensing required, a lot of cash, you know, changing hands and where someone can go buy a tiger cub, take it home, put it in their basement or backyard. And, you know, we, we've seen actually, we, we see in Houston what happened recently, you know. Um, so that was, you know, that was something that I did several years ago. And that was expected and that was shocking when I, when I did that. And, uh, but what I didn't expect to see was when I was at one of these auctions is I looked to my side and what I saw was a celebrity conservationist that I had watched for many years on Name TV. Name names. Uh, <laughs> who, you have to see, you have to see yeah. the film to, you know, <laughs> to see that. But who was standing right there, too. And actually, uh, this person, actually, my kids grew up watching. Ironically, my kids may have been watching this person at the same time that I was at this auction, uh, watching him on TV. And so this person was not there to shut down the auction, was not there to protest, was not there to expose what was going on as, as I was and these other public safety officers. They were there participating, buying and selling animals, feeding into the exotic pet trade. And so it made me wonder, is this a one-time event? Is this an anomaly? Or is this systemic? Is this something that might be happening within the industry more broadly? And, and I will tell you that uh, you know, a little further investigation which only requires looking at an ambassador cat, as you mentioned, on TV, watching our celebrity conservationist uh, tell us where this cat's going and where it came from. Did a very simple exercise, which should have been unremarkable. Just go to the place that they say that this endangered species will end up. And what I found is that animal's not there. These cats aren't there. It <laughs> I have to tell our audience, and yes. I want to jump to Carney Ann and Carol, because it was shocking to me that we're seeing little baby Gus, you know, on, on uh, you know, with Jack Hanna, I'll name names, Jack Hanna, mm -hmm. and others on these morning shows, uh, David Salmoni, others were bringing their pets from Animal Planet, um, and, and you would see them, and these are endangered animals, and there was this whole architecture and scaffolding of how they talked about, you know, being special protected species. And there was, in, you know, this loving and engaging environment where they were free to roam and there were sanctuaries for them. And I just was shocked when there was no registration for any of these animals. And you would go talk to these people. And you got to tell the story, Carnegie, of Tim Harrison, who's just this obsessive, compulsive, retired former cop. Uh, because he's such an important part of the story. But I guess my question to both of you is, as you saw, as we saw, as I saw in this show, these cats disappearing into the ether, mm -hmm. is, are there no laws against this? I mean, what, what is the, how can this be happening? There's no meaningful legal mechanism to figure out where these animals are coming and where they're going, which is outrageous that you have 
a legal framework in the United States of America right now where in some states there are fewer regulations to own a tiger than there are to own a dog. No, if I wanted to go adopt a dog or a cat, it's incredibly difficult, right? Carol, I mean, tell, tell us how you uh, are, are part of this story and what you've been commenting on for a long time with regards to the absence of that legal scaffolding with regards to um, these exotic animals. At our peak, we had to turn away 312 big cats. And every other year, that number was doubling until the Captive Wildlife Safety Act passed. And that made it illegal to sell Because you cats. had no more resources to deal with them, right? Us and all of the legitimate sanctuaries, mm. we were full to the brim with all of these cats because they were breeding hundreds of these lions and tigers every year to be used as these pay-to-play props and then discarding them into pet homes and worse and just disappearing. And so we had been working on a federal ban of this since the 90s, and we got a partial ban in 2003 that actually caused that number to drop. Instead of it doubling to 600 the next year, it dropped to like 160. So then we knew that the only way we were going to fix this was to change the laws, and that's where the Big Cat Public Safety Act came in. Well, Mike, you know, I think when you start the film, as a young boy there, probably in the 60s, I said, that's me. That's right. I'm watching Mutual of Omaha Wild Kingdom. Then I'm watching the Today Show or the David Letterman Show. I'm probably not David Letterman when I was eight years old. But you would see uh, someone who looked like a wildlife conservationist with the jungle hat come in with the, you know, baby lynx or the baby tiger or the baby leopard, and we would play with them. These, this was ABC, NBC, CBS, major networks in the United States that had connected these entertainment sections to their news shows. Is there not a complicity, at, at minimum a blind eye, but if not that, a, a dereliction of responsibility of these news organs about what was happening with these cats and what became of them? I think at least a blind eye, but I think maybe all of us, you know, that's no different than possibly me, even Tim Harrison that you see in the film, and he acknowledges that, which is, you know, what happens is, you know, uh, these conservationists gain our trust. Uh, they have a level of celebrity to them, of course. And I think if anyone else might come on TV or maybe show up at uh, a mall or something like that, you might actually give it a second look and say, is what they're telling me true? I'm not sure I trust this. You know, maybe it would warrant mm. some further investigation. But, you know, when, when, we've, when these celebrities have gained our trust, I think we just don't go and look. We believe what they tell us is true and then we kind of go no further than that. I, I don't think that's unreasonable, and you know, with the shows that they are on, these are people, mm -hmm. the hosts of these shows and the producers of these shows are animal lovers. You know, they're involved in a lot of the same advocacy work that a lot of us are. It's just that the wool has been pulled over all of our eyes you know, with this because of the trust that we put into these celebrities. Carney and some of the uh, celebrities in this are Grant Kammerer, if I have names right, uh, Jared Miller, David Salmoni, um, Jack Hanna, uh, among many others that you profile that are part of the celebrity culture of showing big cats and, and, and sort of, you know, creating a pretend, in, you know, non-existent environment about sanctuaries and the care of these, of these cats. Have any of them responded to what you have unearthed? Have they responded to you formally or even informally in reaction to what you have, um, what you collectively have surfaced? Well, I, I don't know that any of them have seen the movie yet. Um, however, Grant Kemmerer has been in trouble um, in the state of New York for violating state law um, relating to the handling of animals on late night shows and at birthday parties and being a supplier for entertainment. Um, while out of the other side of his mouth saying that he's involved in conservation. So we have seen that um, these individuals have been, you know, implicated in the same nasty industry, whether it's the auctions, the exotic pet trade, the animals you see on late night shows, the exotic animals used in circuses, it's all part of the same cesspool. And they really can't say anything about it because there's no justification for the things they do. They can't debate this with people like us that know it's, what's going on. Yeah, there's no there's no justification. Let me ask you also, Carol, because I know you've been running your, your park um, to help save big cats for um, 30 years. I've not been there, but of course we've seen Tiger King. We've seen the, uh, the issues and the battle you went through on this. But there are a lot of regulatory, out, uh, regulatory authorities out there. The U.S. Department of Agriculture, I assume, the you know, Fish and Game Administration. You know, there, there, there are players out there that one would think 
were part of the regulatory environment in which this has happened. Where have they been? Do you interact with them? I know that you've been very active politically trying to get this legislation passed. When you hear from these parts of the administration, have, have, are they complicit uh, or are they trying to do the right thing? Absolutely complicit. To the point where when I bring it up to our inspectors, why are you not doing something about this at this facility that we have witnessed and we've had all of these people submit complaint forms and they'll say that the higher ups there tell them not to even file a citation because then the animal rights crazies will actually force them to do something about it. So instead they'll make it a teachable moment mm. and not do anything. And so it's been so frustrating that these people will have hundreds of citations before they're ever brought to court. And then usually they'll pay a $2,500 up to a $25,000 fine. They just consider that the price of doing business. Now you, as I understand, I don't know all the legal dimensions, basically were involved, and I, I know Carney and you were with, with um, Joe Exotic and his, his, his uh, Tiger Park and what happened. And as I understand it, you basically received a judgment in that. My question is scale, because when I talked to my producers about doing today's show, and they said, yeah, but how big a deal is this? I said, have you driven across America? Have you gone through some of these states and backwards? There are billboards um, of these kinds of parks, petting zoos, exotic animals, you know, in, in every corner of the United States that I've been. I just never had put it together. How big is this industry? How big is it? And do you have to go through a legal process within each and every one of them to get a change? We refer to it as whack-a-mole because mm. as soon as one of these people loses their license, somebody else just gets it in some other family member name and they continue to do the same bad things. If you think about the thing with Joe Exotic, I mean, we filed that case in 2011 and we weren't able, we still haven't finished the case. Right. <laughs> we weren't even able to take the zoo until last year. So these things just take decades sometimes and the animals die in the meanwhile because there's nobody coming in to protect them from the mm. government. And the traffic, the leading wildlife trafficking monitoring agency, has written about how the defects in the laws in the United States and the lack of enforcement by the U.S. Department of Agriculture and by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service is creating a perfect storm where there's an increasing likelihood that these tigers and other exotic cats born in roadside zoos, born with backyard breeders and all of these exploiters are going to end up also supplementing the demand for tiger parts in other parts of the world. So this is not just, I mean, there are global implications for our lack of doing what we need to do here in the United States. I'm so glad you brought that up. Yeah, it, it, you know, one of the other things that strikes me about the beginning of your powerful film, Mike, is the beginning starts uh, with Tim Harrison and, and you apparently seeing these celebrities at wildlife auctions and then saying, wow, okay, this person, and then the string and the wall, connecting people who, in our eyes, we don't even know are connected. Right. And as it builds up, it's like a police investigation drawing together, you know, who's operating in the mafia and which, which elements do they control. Is this like a mafia? And I'll ask you, because there's one, one scene in the film with Grant um, uh, Kammerer, who's pointing at you folks from uh, a football field where they're showing off their annual tiger cub that they brought in, I think it's OB-47, and he's looking at you menacingly and showing people, were you ever at risk? Yeah, I think that's one of the tactics that we've all experienced too, which is there's an intimidation tactic. So um, this happened when I did my first film, The Elephant in the Living Room, and I realized it the first day that the movie played just for 100 people You need to in tell California. the audience what the elephant in the living room is. Well, the room elephant is. in the is living the room. Is the elephant in the living room? Yes, that's right. So it is the, uh, uh, my first documentary uh, uh, with, with, that really, I think, exposed uh, the issue of exotic pets uh, in America. And the, the day that it world premiered, only just to a small crowd of 100 people in Santa Barbara, the next day I got my first death threat mm. on, 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 the, on my phone. So, and, and many more from there. You see what, of course, of course, obviously what Carol dealt with. And, and but the, the intimidation tactic, uh, some things that aren't in the film were things that uh, where we interviewed people who were trying to give us information about where we could find these missing ambassador cats. They wouldn't reveal their name. They would send anonymous emails. I would record them and record their knees and their feet and so forth. And it's like, but we're just looking for a tiger that we saw on TV. We're just looking for you know, an animal I mean, that's tell, supposedly you, you, you were trying to basically, I mean, one of the fascinating things, yeah. you would take Gus, the tiny little cute tiger, yeah. and say, where's Gus today? And then you had a list of 
more than 200 of these animals that had appeared on morning shows and TV very cuddly with whatever celebrity handler they had with these sanctuaries behind them. And all you did was go to them and say, where is that cat now? Yeah, I think that's the most revealing because at the end of the day, as, as, as far as we go to try to discover it ourselves, you have to go to the source. You have to go to the last person who was seen with that animal and give them the chance, obviously, to say, well, look, I, I, I know that you think this is all some ruse or whatever, but it's not. We've got it right over here and you can see. And you have to leave that open to that possibility. And so it was only fair to do that. But uh, what I wanted was to hear the truth. And so um, I think in the way that I journalistically do as a documentarian, we did that and we did get the truth. And the truth is, this is, this is crazy. They weren't shocked by it. So when you go to someone and say, hey, your ambassador cats are missing mm. that were on TV, nobody was shocked. They're, they just go, yep, mm -hmm. where are they? Not going to tell you. Um, will anybody help us? No. You know, go away. And then you see some of the intimidation factors when we go deeper. So there's quite a contrast between what you see in the film with the recordings and with that interaction than what we see very polished on the TV shows with the, right. with Carol, the Carol, what we're seeing, you're on TikTok. I lurk on TikTok and I'll tell you every, I'm going to have, you know, produce my own videos on TikTok one of these days, but Carol, you're on TikTok and you see what I do. You see the cute, cuddly pictures of uh, exotic species. Sometimes you see people there that are saving uh, 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 animals that have been harmed or hurt and re-releasing them in the wild, which I very, find very moving. But off, more often than not, it's somebody continuing to engage in the same kind of practice. We're seeing visual images where everything is okay and the cat is at the moment. We're not seeing visual images of how they're ending up. You've been in this business for a long time. I want you to describe to our audience, what are the horrors that these, that these animals are going through? You know, when people see those images on TikTok and other social channels, what they're usually seeing is a juvenile animal who's under five years old. It might be 500 pounds, but it's still mentally a kitten, so they're still able to play around with it. As soon as that cat reaches sexual maturity, like with the case of Roy Horn, yeah. they're going to get attacked, and that's going to be the end of it, and there won't be any more TikTok channel for that person. Mm. But the way that these cats end up, the places that I have gone into and rescued cats from, the neighbors would have been absolutely appalled to know that these animals were literally starving right next door and desperate for their lives and being kept in flimsy cages. My daughter reached up to the door of one of these cages one time where we had gone in to rescue 13 tigers and the whole door just collapsed in her hand and it was like all that cat had to have done was hit that door with enough force, it would have been loose in the neighborhood. And we just see this over and over and over again, just wretched conditions. And some of the conditions that you saw in the conservation game, people will be just appalled that those cages contain the most magnificent animals on the planet. And many times these cats, when they're pulled away from their mothers immediately at birth, these roadside zoos and backyard breeders, they're declawing them, which is a partial amputation procedure with pliers and hammers. This is a standard industry practice, and it's just one of the many things that these facilities are doing to try to make these animals less of a liability when they, when they offer them for public contact and pay to play. Mm. Carol, there's a section in Tiger King where all of a sudden there were missing large cats, and you saw even his own staff worried about that and saying, wow, maybe he went and shot them and disappeared them. And I kept wondering as I watched the film, are there killing fields out there? Are there, you know, are, you know where, where do these, where do these be cat? I mean, is that also part of the picture? I'll give you a good example of that, and that is um, Doc Antle, who was in the film Tiger King. Every year he has a, a roadside zoo type thing where people can come in, they can choose from a dozen different cubs to have their picture made. Mm. They can only use them from about eight weeks to 12 weeks, so they have a one month shelf life. There's always plenty of cubs to choose from, and yet his census every year goes up two cats, four cats. It's not going up by the dozens of cats that are being born every year, and yet those cats are not ending up in sanctuaries. We're not seeing them end up in other facilities, so where are all those cats going? And the U.S. Department of Agriculture, when they do their inspections, they're counting what they see, but they're not verifying identities, so they're not checking to see if the same 10 or 20 or 50 or 100 cats are still there the next inspection that they do. So there's this revolving door in roadside zoos and nobody, there's no, there's no legal requirement for anybody to be checking where the cats are coming and where they're going. 
So they're just checking. They're just counting numbers. They're not checking their identities. So I want to be transparent that we are filming this today, our audience, in Washington, D.C. You have visited here both to do my show, so thank you very much, but to talk to people in the policy world um, about what the response ought to be. So, uh, Mike, what are, what are you hoping to achieve um, either, either through public policy or through public attention right now uh, and all of you that you think needs to be um, heard by citizens in this country? Yeah, well, so when you see the conservation game and when you've been in the subculture, as I have as a filmmaker for, say, 10, 12 years, you know, it really pulls back the veil on the illusion that we're talking about that we see, whether it's from the cub petting versus what's really going on afterwards, the vanishing of these animals where the cub is valuable, whereas the full-grown tiger line is not, um, and that, that, you know, translates even to our television celebrity conservationists. So, what I had hoped with this investigation that we did together and also with the film is, is, is the transparency that you talk about, which is so let's see what's really going on mm. here and see what needs to be done. And I think the thing that needs to be done as the film also follows is the passage of the Big Cat Public Safety Act, which would seek to protect these endangered species and keep them out of the hands of backyard breeders, roadside zoos. And what's most curious about that is the pushback that we got from high-level celebrities that we see on TV when we were trying to locate the animals, mm -hmm. we find that there's pushback for that bill as well. So the people that you see on TV telling us to protect and help these endangered species behind the scenes are pushing back to stop the Big Cat Public Safety Act. So Jimmy Kimmel brings these pets on. Mm -hmm. I, Jim, we all know Jimmy Kimmel. Uh, we should call Jimmy Kimmel up and say, where is he on the Big Cat you know, Public Safety Act? Uh, Carol, just in our last minute or so, and, and Carney, if you just, just quick slices, I'd just love to hear how you got into this. I know you started out in West Virginia. I want our audience to understand, you know, in kind of the, the authentic way you came into this world of trying to save these animals. When I was 17, I was rehab and releasing native bobcats that had been hit by cars or orphaned. Right. And I saw what magnificent animals they were and how much territory they need. And so when I saw these animals mm. in captivity, it just broke my heart. Right. And Carney Ann, how did you get in this business? Um, 30 seconds. I grew up in the Palo Alto, Stanford area at the age of 11. I went to interview the director of laboratory research at Stanford University about animal experiments, and I was horrified. And I've been involved in animal protection ever since. And when I had the opportunity to leave a big law firm job to right. pursue animal law, I jumped right. on it. The film is called The Conservation Game. Be sure to watch it when it comes out. Thank you all for being with us. Director Michael Weber, animal law professor Carney Ann Nasser, and the founder of Big Cat Rescue in Florida, Carol Baskin. So what's the bottom line? As with so much in America, there are two totally opposite mentalities at play here. One believes that this is the land of do-whatever-you-want freedom. That means no one can tell you what to do, whether it's about owning assault rifles, getting a coronavirus vaccine, wearing a mask, or regulating wild animals that you want to exploit for profit or social videos or your own ego. The other believes that liberty needs laws and regulations to protect the people, and in some cases, animals, from cruelty and abuse. Through the reality show Tiger King and the epic battle between Joe Exotic and Carol Baskin, more Americans than ever have been exposed to the underbelly of an illicit trade in tigers and other big cats. The film The Conservation Game takes this public awareness a step further, showing us that our entertainers, our media, and our talk shows have been promoting a huge lie about the welfare of exotic species in America. The least we can do is to give wild animals the same protections that we give dogs and cats in America. And that's the bottom line. Thank <laughs> you.